Welcome, and thank you for joining this installment of the NEHA webinar series. I'm Christy Denbrock, your moderator for today, as we discuss nail salons. In partnership with the University of Michigan, joining us to share their research on addressing nail salon hazards, implementing a collaborative and culturally sensitive approach are Dr. Aurora Lay. Dr. Lay is the John G. Sorrell Professor of the Environmental Health Sciences at the U of M School of Public Health and co-leads the Michigan Healthy Nail Salon Cooperative. And joining her is Dr. Marie Ann Rosenberg. Dr. Rosenberg is an Assistant Professor at U of M School of Nursing and the Associate Deputy Director of Occupational Health Nursing Program. Please write your questions into the chat box, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. If you are not a NEHA member and enjoy this session, we invite you to become one at NEHA.org. Dr. Lay, shall we begin? Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Christy. And thank you so much for everyone taking time out of your schedule to join us today. So we will be discussing um, the topic as follows. So we have a few learning objectives for you today. First is that participants will gain a background knowledge on the occupational and environmental hazards, as well as social challenges faced by nail salon workers. We'll describe some of the work that the Michigan Healthy Nail Salon Cooperative does, including our purpose and initiatives. And you'll be able to discuss best practices for collaborating with nail salon workers in a culturally sensitive and linguistically appropriate manner. So first, I would like to provide some background about nail salon workers and who they are. But first, I'd like to present the topic of health disparities in the workplace. So in public health, we think of these as the social determinants of health. These are the facets of your life that essentially affect your health outcomes, right? So these are generally things like your education and access quality, health care, where you live, who you interact with, and economic stability. Generally, people think about your work or your job where you spend a third of your life as only falling within this domain of economic stability, right? Because it's providing you a source of income. But realistically, it affects all the social determinants of health because thinking about like the kind of education and the quality you might have will affect the kind of job you have. The kind of job you have affects the quality of healthcare you may or may not have. Except for remote work, it often dictates where you live and who you interact with. So health disparities in the workplace are occupational health inequities, according to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, are avoidable differences in work-related incidents, mental illness, or morbidity and mortality that are closely linked to the social, economic, and or environmental disadvantages such as work arrangements, sociodemographic characteristics, and organizational factors. A couple of decades ago, when we thought about health in the workplace, we only thought about what's happening in the workplace. But now we understand, especially the COVID-19 pandemic has underscored, your life outside of work affects your work and vice versa. So with nail salon workers, just to give a very brief timeline of here in the United States, between the 20s and the 60s, manicures were considered very expensive and only like a very nice leisure service for extremely wealthy clientele, right? Um, and then there was a perception that these manicures were seen as like gossip mongers and gold diggers. But it wasn't until the Vietnam War, actually, when, um, you know, a lot of refugees like my parents were being brought here to the United States um, and so many folks were looking for a profession and the actress Tippi Hedren who is the mother of Goldie Hawn and the, and the famous actress from the Birds she's known as the godmother of the nail salon industry because 
you know, with her through her activism, she saw these women coming over from Vietnam who needed to like find a way to sustain their living and support their families. So she actually sponsored a lot of refugees to go through cosmetology school. And through that way, it kind of became like other Vietnamese folks would teach other coming to the United States on how to work in nail salons and eventually start their own small business. So that's why no matter where you go in the world, whether you're in Prague or you're in the middle of Oklahoma, a lot of manicurists are Vietnamese. Um, so finally in the 80s, it was recognized as an official profession by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the industry started booming. Towards the 90s and 2000s, you get people really into these services and they're starting to try to drive down costs because there's so much competition, right? Um, so, you know, in previous years, you would expect to get a manicure for like $10, $20, um, but nowadays that really vastly changes based on the trends. Um, but this is still considered, you know, a very intimate labor industry, not because they are like physically touching your hands sometimes, but some people also develop relationships with their manicurists, like see them as friends. Um, but, you know, there's also this dehumanization aspect that happens with a lot of folks who work in the service industry as well, where they are there performing a service or you don't expect them to interact with you that much. And there's some challenges and vulnerabilities that they face. So based on data from um, 2018, if we look at nail salon workers and their wages, um, about a third of workers here in the United States are considered low wage, but if we look at nail salon workers, it's actually about four in five of them. Um, and if we look at the median wage, let's focus on the full time aspect, the median wage is about $20 an hour, whereas for nail salon workers, it's about $9 an hour. And you might be thinking to yourself, wow, why is that? Because like, I definitely get a mani-pedi that's like $70 plus tips, right? Well, generally how it works is the owner who runs the salon takes a portion of the profits from the manicures themselves, or if they're independent contractors renting out a station in the salon, they also have to pay fees for their station. And they may not necessarily always get to keep their tips either. So that's how it breaks down to that cost. Um, the language barrier is also a point of vulnerability for nail salon workers. Most have obtained a high school level degree, but um, not much more than that for the vast majority of nail salon workers, and only about half are English proficient. So if you think about this, it is a pretty low barrier industry in that you can become a manicurist either by going to cosmetology school, which is kind of cost prohibitive, or through apprenticeship, which many become a manicurist through apprenticeship. And they learn what they need to in order to get licensed as a manicurist um, and the basic English proficiency they need to do their job day to day. But if you think about how complex some of the languages on safety data sheets, for example, or OSHA regulations, or even environmental warnings and labels, like they're difficult for me to comprehend sometimes. And I have like, I was born here with a terminal degree. So you can imagine for folks where English is their second language or their third language, how proficiency can make them more vulnerable to what they're doing because they don't necessarily understand the hazards that they're encountering. And there's also issues with wage theft and a lack of benefits. So most nail salon workers do not work eight hours a day. Most of them work upwards of 10, 11 hours a day. But because these are small businesses, they're generally not paid overtime. Um, and, you know, for those of them who do have health insurance, it's generally um, covered through employer provided or through other means like the Affordable Care Act. Now, in 2015, a lot of attention was finally starting to be focused on this industry. The New York Times did an expose that essentially like blew the lid off of this thing, and it was called The Price of Nails, where they looked at the manicure capitals of New York City, Chicago, LA, and Boston. Um, so at this time, the New York courts had lawsuits filed mostly against um, wage theft abuse, where they found that some manicurists in New York were only being paid $1.50 an hour 
hour for 66 hour work weeks. They're charged for drinking water. So like, you know, the waters they give out to customers in the salons, if the workers were to drink that, they would be charged for it. They were underpaid. Um, they were kicked as soon as they sat on pedicure stools. So they were being kicked by their own colleagues and bosses. So this is kind of like a workplace bullying situation. And then verbal abuse from their coworkers, supervisors, but also customers. So in these 30 salons they investigated nearly, they found a, over 100 wage theft violations. Um, and what they did was they followed some of these manicures home and found that, you know, they spend their days providing services to affluent people and then return back to substandard housing conditions. Um, and then also within, you know, the Asian American ethnicities, there's over 50 different types of Asian and Asian Americans here in the United States, but there's this unspoken hierarchy between uh, the ethnicities. So generally, they found Korean nail salon workers were paid twice as much as their peers who might be Vietnamese, Cambodian, Thai, or even Indian. Um, and so through this, you know, the salon workers described a culture of subservience that extended beyond catering to the customers. Um, and then, like we mentioned, like the, the newer employees went through this, this period of hazing. So again, this is really when the general public started really trying to focus on the nail salon industry. But for a long time in occupational environmental health, we think about these exposures. Um, and Dr. Rosenberg and I like to say that nail salon workers are emblematic of low wage immigrant women in the service industry who are largely invisible to the communities they serve. A lot of folks don't necessarily think about their health outcomes, right? It is a small business, so they're not focused on as much as construction or manufacturing or even agricultural workers. But a lot of these women are um, female, childbearing age, working here in their prime childbearing years. And they're exposed to chronic chemicals like toluene, formaldehyde, methyl methacrylate, volatile organic compounds. They're exposed to infectious diseases like various bloodborne pathogens, COVID, fungi, skin infections, a lot of poor ergonomics going on in the nail salons with awkward bending and posturing, um, repetitive cumulative trauma disorders, heat stress, workplace violence and discrimination, potential electrical and safety hazards as well. Sorry, I have discrimination on there twice, but just a whole host of, uh, like a lot of occupational and environmental exposures here. But um, there is some complexity around nail salons and their relationship to environmental and, environmental and occupational regulations and guidelines because of historical mistrust of the government and academic institutions, just like other communities of color, right? Like the Vietnamese community or the Korean community, for example, because of wars and, and, and conflict and those kinds of things going on. Um, anytime they see anyone, no matter what their intentions may be, coming into the salon as an outsider who may say they're from the government or say they're with a, a consulting company or so on, they automatically think that they're going to get in trouble or they're going to get cited in some way. So that is a barrier that is a challenge to overcome because you have to gain that trust. Um, like we said, that SDS and warning labels are frequently only available in English. Um, a lot of complex language and jargon on there. And then working with the nail salon workers, a lot of them understand the acute or short-term implications of some of the exposures, but not the long-term. So for example, if they're working with um, a substance, they might understand, okay, like every time I work with acetone, it causes me my, my throat to feel constricted or like my skin gets irritated. So they understand the acute or short-term implications, but for something like formaldehyde or toluene um, that potentially might cause cancer, 10, 20, 30 years down the line, it's a little bit more challenging for them to understand a, a long-term, more abstract health exposure. Um, and then the difference, again, between licensure via cosmetology schools and apprenticeships. We work with nail salon owners where they say that um, those who they talk to in 
who come from cosmetology school, they basically have to train them all over again because they're not up to date on the current trends and practices that are being offered in nail salons. But with the apprenticeship, right, you're kind of, it's like a, a game of telephone, essentially, where you're learning the technique from someone who learned from someone who might have learned from a YouTube video, which is pretty common. Um, and a lot of the environmental and occupational precautions get left out, obviously. Um, and then Dr. Rosenberg will talk about this more when we get to our research, but licensure requirements. Uh, all 50 states have different licensure requirements for manicurists. So the level of education or apprenticeship they're required to do varies, um, but also like no state has continuing education requirements. Once you're a manicurist, you're a manicurist. Every two years you go, you renew your fee, your license is up to date. But that means that for these new techniques that are coming out, like these dipping powders and gels, acrylics, we all know how proprietary and secretive and unregulated the beauty industry is. So for a lot of these products that don't even specify entirely what's on the label, these nail salon workers are working with cutting edge techniques and brand new products that we don't necessarily know what the hazards are, short term and long term. Okay, I will now turn it over to Dr. Rosenberg to talk about our work. All right, thank you, Dr. Lay. Um, so we are the Michigan Healthy Nail Salon Cooperative, also called MHNSC. And that's what I will be referring to throughout the talk. MHNSC is an uh, interdisciplinary collaboration between the School of Nursing and the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. The primary goal is to be a partner and a resource for local nail salons and worker and nail salon owners and workers in the region with the goal of promoting safe working environments and a healthier workforce. Next slide. So MHNSC was established in 2016. Um, it was a vision of, uh, of Dr. Edward Zellers, who then was the director of the industrial hygiene program here at the University of Michigan. I joined a year later in 2017, and ha I have been co-leading um, the endeavors ever since. And with Dr. Zellers retiring um, right at the cusp of COVID in 2020, uh, Dr. Lay joined in the fall of 2020 and has agreed to co-lead MHNSC with me moving forward. And it's been a pleasure. Given our goal, having a strong partnership and collaboration with local nail salons, um, that's very important for us. So here's a picture that you're looking at is um, one of our growing partnership with a, a salon owner, Camilla, and along with some of her workers at that location. This is our logo on the upper right. Um, and please feel free to visit our working website and follow us on social media. We uh, have a presence on Facebook, Twitter, as well as Instagram. Next slide, please. We have three major pillars that are centered around advocacy, education, and research. For advocacy, we use a community participatory approach to connect with and engage with local nail, salon, um, nail salons to meet their needs. For example, during a conversation um, with a salon owner that was renting a space within a mall, um, they had a client complain because they did not have a handicap access to enter the building to come and get their, um, their nail serviced. The owner asked us to help them identify any regulations as to whether it was their responsibility or the responsibility of the mall to ensure that handicap accessibility. Um, for education, not only do we educate the workers and owners on how to protect their health, but we also train students across uh, disciplines at the University of Michigan who are interested in occupational health and safety. For example, we hold seminars for students who are really wanting to learn about exposure assessments. Our third pillar, um, pillar which is research, we focus on identifying factors that put nail, um, nail salon workers' health at risk. And also we aim to develop interventions to address these concerns. In the next few, few slides, I will share some examples of targeted interventions and other works that we have done to date. Next slide, please. We conducted um, some focus group interviews with nail salon workers in 2017 to understand their needs, all the while getting our names and work out in the community and start creating some type of momentum for MHNSC. 
some of the reported needs required some immediate actions while we plan for more interactive approaches. For example, they reported needing information about hepatitis C, ergonomics, and bloodborne pathogens. We immediately developed and translated these flyers with the help of our English and Vietnamese speaking students and went back to the salons to hand them out. We were aware at this time um, that um, these flyers were very passive, right? They're, they're a most passive approach, but we worked on them in tandem of developing grant applications to develop a more interactive program to address those needs because we know without any money, we can't move things forward. So those grant monies were, um, were really helpful. We still continue to hand out those pamphlets um, even now when we go visit nail salons to try to build some type of connection. Next slide, please. We also developed a walkthrough checklist and conducted a walkthrough at one of the salons. In 2019, we did a walkthrough with a salon um, um, not too far from the university. We shared the checklist with the owner before the day of the walkthrough. When we got to the salon, we had a conversation with the owner to have a good understanding of the operations as well as the context of the workplace and the work environment. Then we proceeded to do the walkthrough. We had a group of students with us, of course, with the okay of the salon owner, and each student had their own papers and they all took notes. After we were done, we came back and collated our notes, discussed our findings, and then we developed a report. We then wrote a letter to share with the salon owner to share our findings from the checklist. And in the letter, in addition to highlighting what we saw um, was working well, we also included some recommendations for improvement. Next slide, please. As you um, can see from the previous slides, at any given time, we have many moving parts and multiple projects going through with MHNSC. We move further to develop an online training module focusing on chemical exposure and safety. We were able to secure fund funding from MLEAD to work on our first phase of this endeavor. Um, the first phase involved developing the content, we use, um, of course, evidence-based um, papers. We use Canvas catalog for the training. After we piloted the training with students as well as salon workers, we found, um, we got some feedback and we found out that we needed to have something more interactive and mobile, mo mobile friendly. So we applied for another funding, which put us to phase two. And uh, we got the funding from the Michigan Graham Sustainability Institute. The funding was enough only to um, cover the English version to put it on the um, interactive platform, which is right now available and live and free to anyone who's interested in, in completing that training. And we are currently heavily on phase three. And actually just this morning, Dr. Lei um, went and got some feedback from some Vietnamese uh, speaking individuals workers who completed the um, the Vietnamese translation of the module, and that should be ready to go live very soon as well. Next slide. Here's a screenshot of the English version, and the Vietnamese version will be similar. It's just the language will be different. The aim was to create a test of a free um, interactive online module tailored to nail salon workers. The virtual training is mobile friendly, so you can use it on your phone in addition to your tablet or your computer and is well suited for adult learners and included sustainability learning objectives. We and our partners are blending technology, environmental justice and occupational health training and nail salon industry specific expertise to help this business sector solve the critical sustainability challenge of disparities in chemical exposure. Next slide, please. So I'll be talking quite a bit on this slide just so I could report um, some of these uh, papers here. The first paper at the very top is a report of the focus group that I alluded to earlier. We recruited the participants by distributing flyers and connecting with owners with whom we already had a partnership. We also developed um, recruitment scripts and ourselves. Um, we, along with students, physically went out to the community and um, we could share the information about MHNSC, our goal and ask individuals if they would be interested in participating in the focus group. The purpose of this qualitative study was to build on our previous efforts to identify their perceived risk, also their health needs, and 
asking them if we were to develop a program or an intervention, what would they like to see and how would they like to see the um, carried out? One of the focus group um, was conducted in a conference room at a local library. The other focus groups were actually able to go after hours when the salons were closed to, um, to conduct them. We asked participants to tell us about their experience as nail salon worker. We asked them if and how they believe their work affected their health. We asked them to tell us a story about something that happened at work that made them feel uncomfortable. Lastly, we asked them if we were to develop the intervention, which I mentioned. So a total of 13 nail salon workers were interviewed, 10 of whom were, were of Vietnamese descent. Um, I will say that we did have a translator present and we did ask the participants, would you rather the interviews be done in English or Vietnamese? And those who said Vietnamese, we had somebody there to translate for us. Um, the work experiences of the participants range between two to 17 years and they worked an average eight to nine hours a day. Um, participants reported a slew of information to us, of course, um, including lack of standardized policy, which Dr. Lee mentioned, um, lack of regulations in education and training. Um, one participant even made the, co the comparison between Michigan and Ohio, where they were saying when they lived in Ohio, um, every two years when they had to review, uh, renew their license, they actually had to take a course. They had to sit into an eight-hour course. While in Michigan, when they moved to Michigan, all they had to do was go pay their research fee, and then they, they were good to go. Participants um, also reported a disconnect between education and training and well work practice. One participant specifically said that they, they never were thought how to um, uh, even address when they cut somebody and the client started bleeding, they didn't know how to, how to care for that. They reported inadequate knowledge on exposure risk and safety protocol. Um, they also reported concern about using unsafe nail products, issues dealing with uh, customer pressure, and also being discriminated against because they were immigrant and had some language barrier for, for some of them. For the second paper, we conducted a review of the literature to explore existing interventions that targeted nail salon workers, right? Because our goal is to not reinvent the wheel. If we found an intervention that seemed to work in another state, of course, we would adapt that and make it work for the uh, workers here in Michigan. We collaborated with the library and informationist to be sure that we exhausted all the possible searches and did not miss any key papers. We found only four papers, actually. The interventions um, range from pamphlet distribution to full day training sessions, and also included pre and post tests. The outcomes included increased knowledge, fewer violations, increased adherence to infection control practices, increased use of per, uh, personal protective equipment, and um, in, improved behavior and attitude toward health and safety practices. And lastly, for the last paper, um, through the Freedom of Information Act, we put a request to a request to the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. Our goal was to understand the current state of nail salons and licensure of workers in the state of Michigan. We received the data from um, January 2017 to March 2021. We analyzed over 13,000 cosmetology establishments to determine if the businesses were exclusively or predominantly providing nail um, services. And as of March 2021, there were uh, about 13,000 nail salons that exclusively provided nail services and about 12,000 licensed manicures in the state of Michigan. And 685 businesses provided nail services as a secondary or additional service. Unfortunately, the Michigan Lara does not have public, um, publicly accessible information on the demographic um, characteristics of the licensed manicures, which we would have appreciated, right? Such as gender, age, or race and ethnicity. Uh, the highest number of disciplinary actions took place in the year of 18, 2018 with about 107 um, salons. There are several, uh, various reasons for the violations, including the businesses not being licensed, 
um, breaking occupational codes, such as lack of professionalisms and threat to safety of the workers and the general public and aiding a bit and abetting an un, in unlicensed practice. So these papers are actually available, um, especially if, if you're affiliated with the university, sometimes they are uh, they have some contract with the library to, to make it available um, to the public. Next, sl next slide. In addition to the several endeavors that I mentioned, we are also making due diligence to continue the conversations about safe NEL work with various audiences. We have held se several webinars. Um, two weeks ago, we held, well, not two weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, we held a viewing of uh, the film Nailed It, followed by a panel which comprised of all Vietnamese descent individuals, including Dr. Le here. We also have Camilla in this beautiful picture here, who we considered our, um, as our star owner partner. She was featured in the Michigan News for her collaboration with us, starting with the training module. And we are happy to say that she um, is finding this collaboration fruitful for her as well, given that now she has been invited to be features in several news media and also to speak about her business, which of course creates visibility for her and her business. We have an MOU um, with her and part of that um, understanding is for her to uh, con connect us and branch out our network to her peers and fellow salon owners and other workers. Back to you, Dr. Lay. Okay, so for this last portion here, we'll be talking about um, collaboration and empowerment in a culturally sensitive and linguistically appropriate uh, approach. Um, so thinking about this in particular, um, I really love this image here by Ricardo Levine Morales, um, which essentially shows um, you know, communities of color and their positioning within social justice and environmental justice. So from the environmental justice standpoint, if we think about communities that live near or have you know, hazardous waste sites placed near their communities, right? It disproportionately tends to be like communities of color and those who are low income. But if we think about these um, occupations as well that have really high proportions of environmental exposures and occupational exposures, if you think about agricultural workers, nail salon workers, hotel workers, um, hospitality workers, those who work in environmental services or janitorial custodial services, right, exposed to a number of biological hazards, chemical hazards, all the things that I mentioned, um, a lot of times you will find uh, workers of color in these positions. Um, and Unfortunately, sometimes that means that, you know, things, the research is shifting for sure, and conversations around equity and justice are, are moving towards this direction. But historically, that means that um, their health and safety has been overlooked, right? Because, and by overlooked, I, I mean, there's even a lack of surveillance data being collected on these worker populations to determine what their injury, illness, and fatality rates are. So that's why for us, you know, um, as somebody who comes from an industrial hygiene background and Dr. Rosenberg is very much, you know, a trained nurse, but we work in mixed methods because there's only so much that air sampling numbers can tell you. There's only so much that blood pressure numbers can tell you. And there's only so much that like even injury and illness records, if they maintain them at all, can tell you. Um, a lot of times it requires qualitative approaches such as focus groups, interviews, really talking to the workers and understanding their experience to piece this whole story together. Um, and for this kind of work, obviously, we find it very rewarding, but you where you got to be in it for the long game, right? This isn't something where you decide to conduct a study or, or collect some data, bing, bang, boom, it's 
you have it in a couple hours, you're not doing like a grab sample, right? Um, you don't have it by the next day. It takes time and investment. But um, through these approaches where we are essentially empowering workers and giving them a voice to tell their story, that also helps them build trust with us as collaborating organizations. So I'll hand it back to Dr. Rosenberg to talk more about these points. Yes, so um, I, I don't know how else I could really emphasize the importance of collaboration. Um, uh, Dr. Lay and I, we are at the university system and I am keenly aware that I am, I am an immigrant myself, but I am not of Vietnamese descent, so I don't speak Vietnamese. So um, really understanding the importance of having a team that is cult, um, that is culturally um, congruent with the demographic composition of the workers and really in tune with the issues related to trust in you know in academic and governmental institution that's important. Um, so I was super elated that Dr. Lei joined the team because she's of Vietnamese descent. So when we go to a salon, um, you know people would be you know really akin to connecting with us as well as having Vietnamese speaking students and continue to build the collaboration with and partnership with local salons. Um, and really in the Nelson salon worker community, positive word of mouth goes further than media or publication. So um, when we meet with a worker or a salon owner, we really try to build a bridge, keep that bridge, reinforce that bridge. And so we can branch out and, and continue building on that partnership. Back to you. Thank you. Um, uh, so what is, so just say for these folks here, like everybody on the call, obviously you're like in a NEHA webinar, right? So you have, you either work in environmental health or you have some relationship to it. But what about the average consumer? What can they do for nail salon workers? I'm sure you yourself either get nail services or you know somebody in your life who regularly gets nail services. So when we talk about nail salon workers, the point is not to scare you away from getting your nails done at all. That is absolutely not our purpose. In fact, that would be going in the opposite direction of our purpose, right? Because we want to keep these workers earning a living and that is their livelihood. Um, but ultimately the goal is to empower them and to sustain their health so that they can keep doing this for the rest of you know their life or maybe up until retirement until they're 65 right um so in california we collaborate with the california health and nail salon collaborative um and they're a couple of decades ahead of most states in terms of uh worker rights and you know cal osha cal epa regulations um and talking to them it's interesting that to hear that um you know, there's still this perception from nail salon owners that customers want the cheapest services that they can get. But now with these, you know, more environmental awareness, I would say, with like millennials and Gen Z being a huge part of the economy, um, a California sir, um California did a survey of consumers and found that most of them, like upwards of 75%, would actually be willing to pay more um, for their nail services if they were to use products that did not contain a toxic trio, right, um, or um, were you know, free, they even have 11 free now, which are like plant-based nail products. Um, and so the consumers actually drive this industry. And if you have a relationship or the person, you know, has a relationship with the manicurist or the owner, make the voice known like, hey, I'm willing to pay more products so that your workers can live like a longer, healthy life, might be like two to three additional dollars per services tacked on to the service. I mean, it's very nice for you to tip your worker and you should continue to do that. Um, but the power of the dollar and the power of a consumer drives honestly a lot more change 
then the workers can, and even we can. So we're trying to take a top-down and bottom-up approach, top-down meaning policy changes, working with um, state OSHA and licensing boards, and then bottom-up, you know, getting the workers the education they need. But the, the power of the consumer has a lot further to go. So if you notice, um, you know, a parallel example, right, um, with the straws thing, uh, with the plastic straws, you know, people were really concerned about the turtles and the big floating plastic patch in the Pacific Ocean. And so now you have all of these like lids that are like adult sippy cups, or you have those paper straws. I even drank one that was a noodle uh, at a restaurant, essentially like an uncooked noodle. I was like, all right, this is new. Um, but you can see how quickly things change in a short period of time with the consumers driving it. So that's potentially what we can do for advocacy for the average nail salon worker, but also just treating them like human beings. Um, there's often, you know, a lot of jokes and comedy bits out there uh, about these stereotypical impressions of nail salon workers. They like to gossip. They always are trying to upcharge you on services. They want to know why you don't have a boyfriend right now, these kinds of things, right? But they are just trying to connect with you as a human being. Um ask them about them sometime, ask them about their life, because I think that the more we begin to humanize these workers and see them as people who deserve to have the same protections, the same rights, just like everybody else, they're not just scrubbing the calluses off your feet, um, just this incremental change um, can go a long way. Um, so with that, I will let Dr. Rosenberg finish it out, and then we'll take, I see a bunch of questions. Yeah, sure. So quickly, um, we would be remiss to not actually acknowledge the funding mechanism that has been supporting MHNSC's efforts so far, and we do have a couple of other projects that we're planning on submitting to get additional funding to keep the work going. Next slide, please. And as you see on this slide, we have a wide internal and external partnership network, and we um, are hoping to continue to build on those to um, expand our work. The California Health uh, Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, uh, Collaborative, I mean, Aura already mentioned how helpful they've been to us. We attend their weekly meetings. We actually are learning from them. Um, one key takeaway message from the first time I attended their meeting was for us to not be discouraged because we were saying, oh my goodness, it's taking us quite a bit of time to build that rapport and get the trust of the community. And they said, we've been at this for years. So um, continue what you're doing, don't give up. Next, please. And of course, as I mentioned, um, Dr. Zellers and Stephanie Saylor, who was at the School of Public Health at that time, along with these other two, um, with Swati, um, uh, Swati was at that time with the California Nail Salon Collaborative, and Tuan is still working with us um, and really spearheading um, MHNSC and keeping it going. Next. And a special thanks to um, all the participating salon owners and workers and managers, and also um, these other individuals, as well as our students. We are so thankful for our students, our student volunteers. Some of them, sometimes they're volunteering their time. Others, if we have the funding, we're able to cover them, but some of them actually are doing this on their own free time with no pay, where they're actually on, you know, boots on the ground, connecting, trying to recruit. And the only thing um, we understand is to actually get the ear of the owner, you have to have money, right? If you go and get your nails done, then while they're doing their nails, you start a conversation. I went to a salon not too long ago. They were asking uh, $70 for, um, for the pedicure and then $105 for the nails. So you cannot um, ask a student, <laughs> a poor student, to use their own money to go do that. If So definitely needing some money. So we really are thankful for the students. 
And I think that's it. Thank you. Well, I will not say we'll take questions because we already have some. Yeah, so I guess um, we can go one by one. We'll answer these live. Um, so I'll start, I guess I'll read the question and then, uh, or Christy, or do you want to read the question? Yeah, we're getting quite a few and okay. some of them are repetitive. So if you don't mind, I will ask, ask you the questions that I'm seeing most often come through. Okay, we'll let you so, field them. <laughs> thank you. So first and foremost, we have multiple questions asking, will you share your slides and your checklist? Yeah, I mean, what, where, where can we do that, Christy? You could drop those into the chat box. If you have a link to the slides, you could drop them in the chat box. Otherwise, you could send them back to me at Neha, and we will be able to upload those. Okay, we'll send those to you, Christy. Yes. Perfect. So there, all I can say is, wow, I have so many questions myself floating around in my mind as a former journalist. There are so many layers to this topic, and it looks like you have scratched the surface of so many different layers. And we have one question that wow, I didn't even think of, they are asking, did you look at the nail salons that serve food and drinks? Is that a whole nother layer of a food safety aspect of salons? Yes. So uh, Dr. Rosenberg, feel free to chime in. Um, yeah, some of them do serve drinks to their customers. Um, so Accidental ingestion mm -hmm. is a potential issue for the consumer, but honestly, we're more worried about the workers because nail salons have such a small amount of space that they function in. So a lot of times their chemical storeroom in the back is also where their autoclave is kept for their materials is also where their staff microwave is kept. So the break room is essentially the chemical storeroom. Um, and so a lot of education and training is still needed on the importance of separating those two areas out. Um, we have not been to any salons that like serve appetizers or hors d'oeuvres or anything like that. Those might be some of the higher end salons. Most do offer beverages like, um, you know, water, um, carbonated fizzy drinks, or like if it's super fancy, they might do like mimosas or something like that. Um, but obviously the FDA doesn't get involved or regulate anything. The health department doesn't get involved. Like, again, these are very small businesses. So mm -hmm. unless somebody whistleblows, nothing's going to happen. And a lot of these workers may be in precarious work arrangements or undocumented um, and in a vulnerable position with their boss. So they're not, they're not going to whistleblow. Uh, right, right. And, and also, most importantly, we'll see that some of the workers, they'll have um, some refreshments at their workstation. Um, so we, we do have that um, in the training, making sure that if you have some water or, or anything to keep you hydrated while you're providing service, make sure that it's covered, right? Because while you're filing a nail or um, using the drill or anything like that, you don't want to um, ingest that um, that chemical by, by going through your food or, or your drink. And then also a lot of these salons, I, I, you know, we're finding out that they're family owned. So there is the thing of, you know, Dr. Lee mentioned somebody being scared of talking to their boss, but what if, you know, it's, it's your mom or, or your uncle who owns the, the, the rest, not the restaurant, the, the salon. And it, it's, it's another conversation for you to have to say, okay, what are we going to do together as a family to make sure that we, we are safe and you know we're healthy to continue the business going. Another question that we received is back to the chemical exposure. And they've asked um, if you have run into situations where the salons have exceeded the OSHA PELs, or is it a matter more of a chronic low level exposure to these type of chemicals? Oh, can I? Yeah, go ahead, Laura. No, you go ahead, Dr. Rosenberg. 
Well, I, I was going to say that um, subjectively, we would say both, right? But that's our goal, right? The goal would be for us to go ahead and do the actual measurements ourselves. There was a study done by Dr. Batterman, who's also um, one of the partners at the University of Michigan School of, um, School of Public Health, and they did some um, quick measurement <laughs> um, uh, of, uh, of chemical exposures, but unfortunately, um, it was the person who was getting their nails done who was wearing the device and not the worker. So of course they did identify um, some low level of exposures, but we, we are sure that if it were the worker, we would find higher levels. So the answer is we think yes, but we do not have the hard, evidence to to show to say yes for now as of yet yes michigan so in michigan so if you mm -hmm. look at i believe it's open access um this paper by batterman and and zhang 2019 like dr rosenberg said it was the researchers coming in as customers wearing the mm -hmm. ear samplers not the workers themselves because they didn't get consent for that um, because like we said, like putting a personal air sampling device on a worker when you don't even know them is very invasive in this field. Um, and so in that paper, they documented, we use the ACGIH TLV since they're more conservative than the OSHA PELs. But throughout this period, one hour period, you'll see it fluctuate way below the permissible exposure limit to sometimes 10,000 times the amount of the permissible exposure limits. But if you average it out, a lot of times it falls below, below the TWA. Um, so California has worked on doing some area sampling as well. But um, like we said, yes, yes to both. But definitively, it has been very challenging to collect that data. Well, we have a question from California. Oh. And <laughs> perfect segue. And it says in California, we do as, or it's the first they're asking of who certifies healthy nail salons. And they're saying in California, we do so as a voluntary program out of our Department of Environmental Health. But there is a state board that does the training and the licensure. That is correct. And um, so we have other questions too of different states of who does the licensing and who certifies those? Who does the inspections? And as you said earlier, is that different in all 50 states? Yes, it's different in all 50 states. So in California, it is the state board of the California State Board of Cosmetology. In um, Michigan, it is LARA, which is the licensure affairs and regulatory. I'm, it's, it's escaping me right now. Um, so in California, the Healthy Nail Salon program is administered by county health departments, and it is completely voluntary for nail salons to opt into the Healthy Nail Salon program, where they get support from California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, rebates on like upgrading their ventilation system, consulting, et cetera, essentially to make this commitment that they are going to carry less hazardous uh, products and like, uh, you know, do the whole hierarchy of controls and they periodically get inspected by CHNSC to make sure that they are still falling within the parameters to be considered a healthy nail salon. That is our ultimate goal here in Michigan. Um, but I think we're about five to 10 years away from that happening, which is how long it took to set that up in California. So it does differ from state to state. Um, the licensing board does inspection, right, just to make sure the business is up to code and on the up and up. But the licensing board and the state OSHA or the OSHA inspectors, if there's no state OSHA, don't necessarily talk to each other um, and their data does not cross in any way. So licensure issues and things, licensure is to protect the consumer. It's primarily to protect the consumer. Uh, OSHA is there to make sure the workers are healthy, right? So you have two different um, 
that like governmental entities essentially regulating these nail salons with very different goals, but they're not checking on them all that often. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Rosenberg? No, you were really thorough. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have so many questions. I'm going back and forth to weed out the redundant ones, but this okay. one is really interesting. As well, they're talking about their state. And unfortunately, I don't know which state they're referring to. But they are saying, for example, a local authority doesn't charge permit fees for the first year or two and only inspect the facility once every two years initially before going an to an annual inspection and an annual permit fee. Currently, they are only inspecting on a complaint basis. And so moving to routine inspections would be a big change. Are you finding that in other states as well, where it's not being looked at at all until it's put on the radar by a complaint? Yes, that is the case in Michigan as well. Yeah. Um, and the unlicensed activity isn't necessarily because people are doing anything lascivious. It's because mm -hmm. here in the state of Michigan for licensure, one of the requirements is that you provide a social security number on your application, whereas states in, like California have changed that based on advocacy from California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative to only require the alien registration ID number and no social security number. So you basically have people who just want to earn a living, but because they don't have a social security number yet, they are performing services without a license. A license. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Rosenberg? No. Okay. Okay, I believe we have time for one final question. And this Christy, one, yes, there's one that says fish. That's the one I was asking okay, you. Great. It was that any comments on the use of the procedure of quote unquote fish pedicures and that some high-end salons in Ohio are advertising those. What are your thoughts on that procedure? I don't, think I've, heard, I don't think I've heard that oh. one. There. <laughs> oh, so this, I've seen it advertised. I've seen it. Um, yeah. Yeah. There are certain, they look like little guppies essentially. And you stick your feet in with all these little fish and they are specifically fish that feed on dead skin. Um, oh, that's what it's called. Yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. What are our thoughts on it? It's very interesting. Um, one of the misperceptions that um, a lot of consumers at nail salons have when you get a pedicure is that they technically are not supposed to file down your calluses or cut any live skin. Dead skin, yes, right? But a lot of times, like we found out in our focus groups, the customers will pressure the workers to essentially act as a podiatrist that is not what they're trained to do, right? They're not trained to take care of your feet. They're there to make your toes look good. Um, so they're not technically allowed to cut live skin or file down calluses because that can expose them to like bloodborne pathogens and all kinds of things. So I think the fish is kind of a way to like a workaround to that, but it's also like something kind of like novel and ex exotic perhaps that people want to try out i've gotten a pedicure before when i was living in in southern indiana where it was golf balls that you massage your feet on and it was like and you wore a, you wore a straw hat while you got this <laughs> pedicure this was not a vietnamese owned salon um i don't know how they would regulate the fish pedicures though so i unfortunately cannot to that. Well, it looks like that is all the time we have for today. But in this question, the official term of the fish pedicure, I don't know how to pronounce it, is G-A-R-R-A-F-U-F-A. -F -F -A. So that is the official name of the 
fish pedicure. And so we at NEHA would like to thank the University of Michigan and especially our guests, Dr. Lay and Dr. Rosenberg for their expertise and their gift of their time. Your feedback is important to us and we encourage you to fill out the survey, which you will receive to help us to continue our mission to build, sustain, and empower an effective environmental health workforce. And we thank you all for joining us today.